to blame all my guilt on this world I was in. Surface relationships used me till I was done in. And although while someone was waiting to free me from my sin. If you will, please stand. Turn your song books to page 441. Great is thy faithfulness. Page 441. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of returning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassion, thy fail not. As thou hast been, so forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercy I see. All I have need in thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter, time, time and harvest, sun, noon and stars, where they're counting the above. Join with all nations in manifold witness. Go thy great faithfulness, mercy and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercy I see. All I have need in thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin, and a peace not endureth. Thy own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today, and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine, with ten thousand be beside. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercy I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Amen. You may be seated. 
book of Romans tonight. He was there all the time. And great is his faithfulness. You ever think about those two things? He is there all the time. And great is his faithfulness. Uh, you ever think about when you go to pray? You got an emergency? And you go to pray and you say, Dear Father, Dear Lord, whatever it might be. As Brother Strunk would say, if you've got your DVD turned on, uh, and the Lord says, uh, stick her there, out for lunch. Uh, had company come, I can't do anything for you right now. Uh, but he's there all the time. <laughs> day or night, night or day, he's there, and great is his faithfulness. And I'm sure thankful uh, that he is. Uh, well, you're turning to Romans. Go to chapter 13. On the way out, take some tracks and uh, pass them out, invite people to come. Uh, have you ever noticed on the back of those tracks, they've got a place there and says tells you how to be saved, and then if you will accept the Lord uh, to fill uh, this track out, your name and address and so forth, and send it in, and uh, in the mail, I don't remember the last day or two. We got a track, had an address I didn't recognize in a town uh, not far from here. And uh, a woman said that she had accepted Jesus Christ as her Savior. And uh, I don't know who put that track out. It may have been you if you put tracks out. Uh, a lot of folks I know have been saved but never so send those back in. But uh, I was thrilled with that. And I want you to know it might have been the one you gave out. Uh, to think you gave that track out and they called on the Lord and he was there waiting on them to call upon him. And he is faithful. He says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thank God. I pray you have been there on Facebook tonight. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, we pray that you would trust in him, his finished works. He's already paid for your sins on Calvary. But my friend, in order to go to heaven, you must receive the gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And if you're here tonight without him, the same thing. This evening, I want to just speak to you uh, for a little while on, uh, well, out of, uh, Romans 13, Romans 1, and we'll throw in a few other verses and scriptures uh, along the line. And if you would, look in Romans chapter 13, and uh, let's look down to about uh, verse 7 and 8. Romans 13, 7 and 8. Render, therefore, to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due. Custom to whom custom 
fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. And verse 8, Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth one another hath fulfilled the law. In the book of First Corinthians, in chapter 7, I just want to give you one verse there. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 23, it is talking to believers. And it says, For ye are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. Tonight I want us to think, hear Paul speaking in both of these places, and I've entitled it Paul's I Am's. That should be our I Am's also. Uh, the Apostle Paul speaking in his I Am's. You remember Jesus, we've spoke different times through the years on the seven I Am's of Jesus. And uh, I am the bread of life. And I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And uh, But tonight, some things the Apostle Paul said. And here I, I find he said, Oh, no man anything. The first verses here, in, or the first words here, in verse 8 of Romans 13, he said, Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth one another hath fulfilled the law. Paul said, Owe no man anything. We hear that and we'll see. We, we think about debt. If there's anything I hate, it's debt. <laughs> Uh, it's debt, and uh, I, I think you're probably that way too. But uh, they tell me today, if figures was right, that I looked up, today America's national debt is somewhere about $27 trillion. $27 trillion. I can't even... Imagine how much that is. I mean, uh, even with the calculators, I still couldn't count uh, that far. And But you think about that. Uh, $27 trillion. If the Lord does not come back soon, as Brother Bremley said the other day, I believe he will. I believe he will be back soon. But my friend, if... America could not add any more to that national debt, and we would start paying that debt off. It would be somewhere probably our grandchildren's 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 grandchildren, and then a few more before that it ever even get close to being paid off. That's a lot of debt. Uh, America, if we, if America could learn one thing, and that is there's nothing that's free. And uh, I'm not against helping, you know that. But my friend, uh, the Bible still says if a man won't work, he shouldn't eat. I told my wife this week, she hadn't cooked in a while. And I just happened to think of that verse. And I told her, if you don't start working and cooking, you're going to have to quit eating. Uh, but uh, it's so true, is it not? With that amount of debt, that averages out to the debt for each American somewhere at $90,460. That debt that at twenty seven trillion would be somewhere for Americans, each one. Now, if each of us would take ninety thousand four hundred and sixty dollars and give to the government, 
it could pay it all off. But like the little boy said, uh, he uh, asked the Lord for uh, so much money. I don't remember what it was. And uh, uh, no, he'd, he'd ask Santa Claus for it. I'm sorry. He'd asked Santa Claus for so much for Christmas, and uh, he'd sent a letter to Santa Claus, and somewhere along the line, that uh, uh, letter got into the hands of those in Washington, D.C., and so they thought that was real cute, and they sent him back a letter. He'd asked for $100, and uh, I believe it was, and so in Washington there, they sent him $50. And when he got the letter and he opened it up, and he got the $50, he was thrilled. But uh, he wrote another letter to Santa Claus. I said, Santa Claus, I thank you much for what you give me. But I said, next time, don't send it through Washington. Uh, uh, you know, we got a, uh, but that's a lot of debt. They also tell us today that the average family, the credit card debt that the average family has today, and that's taking all of them and averaging them out, but is $6,270 that the average person has on a credit card. Uh, Americans owe 800 and seven billion dollars on credit cards. That is somewhere around 506 million credit cards. That much money is on. By the way, have you got anything lately that's wanting to give you another credit card? <laughs> or wanting to raise your uh, amount you can get on a credit card? Uh, easy come, but not easy to pay off, is it? Uh, now, tonight, I'm not going to tell you that it's sinful. I'm not going to tell you it's completely wrong to have a debt. But you cannot, scripturally, you cannot have a debt that you don't, that you cannot pay it off. If you cannot pay it, then you should not make that debt. Uh, house payment, uh, you know, uh, you got to have a place to live, but don't buy more than you can buy. I, I saw this week, there's something come up, and uh, homes and all in Fairfield County uh, that was selling, and the prices of my land, uh, astronomical uh, so much, uh, but I mean, there, there's certain things you've got to have. Uh, that does not mean you got to have three new cars. That does not mean that we've got to have uh, five 28 or 28 inch screen. I guess that'd be small anymore. <laughs> but uh, 78 or 80 inch screen uh, televisions and all these things. Uh, there's some things that uh, we'd be better off not to buy. But Christians never make a debt that you cannot pay. I'm not saying we don't use credit cards. My wife and I do. Uh, we do it because you can make money off of it. You say, how do you make money off of it? Whatever you buy, uh, if you pay that off when it comes due, and I don't know how she did it, but some way uh, she just pays it off immediately, and then that adds up together, and she gets, I think, a 10-cent root beer forever. Uh, but anyway, uh, what we get, we pay off when it comes in the mail. Uh, be careful. If you start building up on a credit card, my friend, you're going to find one day that you head over hill in debt, and you ended up paying more and more interest for less and less. Uh, if you want something, save the money and pay for it ahead of time. The problem 
if we don't, is the interest is going to eat us up. And so just be careful. Uh, there's a lot. Uh, I believe that I know personally I'm in debt. Uh, I'm in debt to my wife. I'm in debt to my children. I'm in debt to uh, my church. I'm in debt to my people. When I, my wife and I married, there's some promises that we made to each other there. Uh, when God gave us the children, they're our children, and I am in debt to them to raise them according to this old book right here. I mean, uh, as your preacher, I'm in debt to you. I'm indebted to do one thing, and that is preach this old book right here. Uh, so uh, just think about it. But then Paul said, oh, no man, anything. But then in chapter 1, Paul was talking, Romans 1, verse 14, he said, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. We find Paul, the Word of God, telling us that we that are saved, we're a debtor to the gospel. He said again, I am debtor both to the Greeks, and he named each of these. The gospel is free. Didn't cost you and I one thing. It cost God his son. It cost Jesus his life. It cost Jesus everything. But the gospel for you and I is free. He has saved us. But my friend, we are debtors to others to give them the word of God that they might be saved. The giving of the gospel is the root of the message of the Lord when he said, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, there in Acts 1.8. And to be ready, to be ready means to be prepared, to be willing to give the message of his life, the message, the life of Christ, the gospel that we are indebted to give that to others. We are to tell the good news to others. We're to tell what Jesus has done in our lives. First Peter chapter one and verse number uh, wrong. Uh, first Peter chapter three and verse number fifteen. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer. To every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We find the Apostle Paul speaks here of being under obligation to the gospel to the point that he has a, a great concern for other people, for those who have not heard the good news of Jesus Christ. And Paul said, because, because Christ saved me, I am obligated, I have an obligation to tell others 
how to be saved. So we find and we see Paul, we find that he told the good news everywhere he went. He told the news that Jesus Christ died for man's sin. Paul told them but because he knew that they needed the gospel, that everyone needed the gospel. My friends, in this world we live today, it's the same. Every person needs the gospel. And we're obligated to give out the good news. Here we find that Paul mentioned the Greeks and the barbarians and the wise and the unwise. But he's saying this to show that the gospel is for all people. You know, the gospel is just not for a select few, but it's for everyone. It's for the down and out. It's for the up and out. And it's for all in between. Everybody needs to be saved. There's no difference any way, shape, or form. And Paul said, I am indebted to those to give them the gospel. Why? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, that can be the rich, the poor, the red, yellow, black, and white, the mean, the good, the man, the woman. I mean, all people is whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, the gospel has impacted and has penetrated our lives so much that we realize, Paul did and we ought to, that we have an obligation to share the good news with all others. We are debtor. We are in debt to the lost to give them the news of Jesus Christ. There's an old song, and I can't think of the name of it, but it's about the uh, little gypsy boy, I believe it died, wasn't it? But uh, the song goes on about the little gypsy boy and some way that he would keep telling that it would be heard that no man would be able to say, nobody ever told me about Jesus. They all deserve to hear the gospel. You say, preacher, they won't all be saved. I know it. But that track said some will. I got one of those tracks back a few years ago. I went into a funeral home. His wife had died. Many, many people there. But you know, as happens many times at funerals and all, the people get together and get to talking. Many times they forget the ones who are there. So I walked in. I saw this man sitting by the casket by himself. No one talking to him. No one around. I went up. And I, I had met part of the family. In fact, I'd preached the funerals of many in that family. But I went up not knowing this man and told him who I was and just talked to him. And he said, Preacher, would you come to my house and talk to me? I said, I'll be there. In a few days, I went to the house. And he didn't get saved, but we pulled a track out. It's not a track, it's in here, uh, somewhere here. But uh, pulled a track out and laid it on his table. In a day or two, we got a letter, seen the man's name on the outside, opened it up and pulled the track out. He had filled this out right here, that he got saved. That man came in church, stayed here till the day that he died. We preached his funeral. Folks, everyone needs the gospel. Give it out. 
Take, give these tracts out. You say people don't want them. But people need them. <laughs> you see, you sow the seeds. If people don't want them, just tell them I'll pray for you. And do pray for them then. But Paul felt that obligation to give out the gospel. Now, second of all, Paul said, I'm ready to preach the gospel. He said in verse 15, chapter 1, So as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are at Rome also. And the giving of the gospel, as I said, is the roots of the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he said and there in Acts 1, 8, And ye shall be witnesses unto me, to be ready to speak. To be ready speaks of having a passion for Jesus and a willingness to get the message of his life, the gospel, out to others. The gospel calls for each of us to evangelize, to announce, if you will, the good news of what Jesus Christ has done in our lives. If you have been saved, you know what God did for you. And if you know what God has done for you, that's the best testimony you can give. Now, if you tell them you're saved and you love the Lord, and then you turn around and start cussing and cursing and uh, drinking and smoking and chewing and all, you might as well keep your mouth shut. You'd probably be better off to. But the Lord saved you. He made a difference. I know the day that the Lord saved me, my wife and I was talking uh, the other day. And no, I, I, I didn't want anything to do with the church. and I, I can't say I didn't want anything to do with the Lord because I didn't know anything about it. But I finally went to keep her from bothering me. The Lord saved me that morning, and I've been going ever since. You see... Our job is to plant the seed. Paul said, I'm in debt. I'm in debt to all people. But he also said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed, verse 16, chapter 1, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? He said, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believe it's the power of God the salvation I tell you that's that's a lot of power to save a person you go down to Florida and there where they send these uh, crazy people into space going to the moon and all you know why would anybody want to go to the moon what was it uh, three folks I believe just come back from there a Russian and, uh, I don't know, American or two or something. But what was it, about a year that they'd been up there in space? I, I tell you, I think that's a wasted year of life uh, setting up up there. But um, power that they can take and set that power off and blow that space ship all the way in the space you go a long way but you know they've never made one that has the power to send someone to heaven it's only the gospel of jesus christ that has the power the power of god on the salvation to those who believe and paul said i'm not ashamed of it I'm not ashamed of the Lord. I mean, after all he's done for me, Paul said, I, I'm not ashamed. Christian, you know one reason that we don't witness the way we ought to? I'm afraid it's because we're ashamed. <laughs> so many times we're afraid what people's going to say to us. Ashamed. You see, the gospel... We shouldn't be ashamed of it. 
because the gospel is the only way, the only thing that has the power to change the heart of a man. The only thing that has the power to save a person, the only thing that can take and change the heart. One man, Beth's uncle, may have to have that heart transplant. I've got a nephew at the moment waiting for a kidney transplant, young man. You know, they can take the heart of one person to put it in another. It's a miracle. It's miraculous how these things can be done. But you know, it's only the Lord that can change the heart and make a man right with God. The only one. A lot of times people take and have the heart transplants. And then they go right back to the old way of living. I got a call one day, a man had died. I went, they told me the story. This man was the first man to have a heart replacement or where they take one heart put in. They told this man before he left the hospital, said, sir, said, it looks like everything's gonna be okay. To make a long story short, they told him, said, sir, if you pick up one cigarette, you're going to pick up two, and you're going to pick up three. And he said, you will die. I got that call that day. The doctors told his family he died from smoking those cigarettes. That new heart could not take it. He did good. But he thought he knew better. And say, friend, you and I might think we know best, but God's word says there's only one way, and that's through the blood of Jesus Christ. And Paul said, the Lord saved me. me. I mean, think of Paul and read about him in this book. Paul said, the Lord saved me. I'm so glad and I'm not ashamed of it. Shout out God. God's done the same for us. We should not be ashamed of it. We need to give out the gospel. The gospel is the power to change a man's heart. And if we believe in that power, if we believe in that, and if we give it out, we sow the seed, then God will save. We find that the gospel displays the righteousness of God. The Apostle Paul said that he understood from his own life that man cannot live right. He cannot live right enough to obtain a righteous standing before God. I don't care how good a person can be. You might be the best person in the world. You might be. It's kind of doubtful, okay, if any of us are. But you might be the very best person in the world. But you're not righteous. The Bible said for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There are none righteous. No, not one. The apostle Paul knew that his righteousness was not good enough and that our righteousness. You say, well, preacher, I come to church every service. Well, Thank God for that. We all need to. 
I think that's right, and we all need to. Some of you still won't, amen. You know what that means? You're not planning on being here Sunday morning. But we can, we can be the very best. But my friend, it took the best of God's Son to go to the cross of Calvary. And there he paid Roy Maple's sin debt. And he paid your sin debt. He loves you. He loves you. And Paul said, I'm not ashamed of it because I know that no one is good enough. We come to Romans 10 and all, and Paul talks about how much he loved his brethren. He said, "I, if I could, which he couldn't, but he said, if I could, I'd be willing to give of my own salvation. I'd be willing to give it to my brothers and my sisters that they might be saved. Paul had a love for his people, but Paul also knew that the only way they could be saved was through the Lord Jesus Christ, his righteousness. As a debtor, Paul was concerned to get the gospel out to others. I wonder, are, are we debtors? Are we debtors to our wives, our husbands? Our wife, our husband, not two each. Uh, but are we debtor to our children? We are. We're debtor to others. My friend, so many times we're ashamed. You got the tracks in your pocket. You give them out. You can't give them out to the wrong person. Some of you may have been with me. We was passing out tracks over in the uh, shopping center, and uh, someone got one. When I saw him, made him mad. He took it. And he just took that track. He looked at it. He just took it and wadded it up. Threw it down. I just stood there for a few minutes and watched. There came a guy walking up. What was that guy did? Reached down, picked that track up. He opened up and read it. This was on Saturday. Sunday morning, he sat where you sat. You see, it might be foolishness what we think we're doing, but God's got his hand over it all. We're debtors to give out the gospel. It's not your place and my place to save people, we can't. I can't grow a tomato, but I can plant a seed. I can't grow a roaster near myself, but I can sow, I can plant an ear of corn. Well, I do like, you see those new planters they got? I mean, for just the average small farmer, they got one, they took a tube, I believe it's a piece of, uh, PVC pipe, and they got it down on the bottom of the or on the bottom. They take it, got a point, and they put it down in the row, and then they drop a grain of corn in it. I thought that's pretty good. They don't even have to bend over and to plant to say, new ways of planting it, but they're not new ways of growing it. It must be the Lord. We can plant the seed, but God gives the increase. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of it. Child of God, let's don't be ashamed. Let's give it to our families. Let's give it to our loved ones. Let's give it to our neighbors. Let's give it to those around us and let's send it into all the world. Go ye into all the world. Preach the gospel.
unto every creature. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed as we stand. Pianist is coming. We pray tonight if there's a need in your heart. Without Jesus come, Christian, there's a need you come. As the pianist plays, will you come?